So I'm Josh Bryant. Like I said, I'm a director of technical account management at Tanium. And I'm Robert Falcone. I'm a threat researcher over at uh, Palo Alto Networks on Unit 42. And today we're going to talk about web shells. Uh, why web shells? Well, this is what US CERT had to say about it a few years ago. They've been around a really long time, probably since the creation of the web. And uh, the tactics are just getting better and better. And we're finding more and more of them. Yeah, so this is what we're going to be uh, talking about today, is these web shells, OK? Uh, it, there's, there's so many out there. It's, it's unbelievable. So you can go to, to, to GitHub repositories and, and find hundreds of these just easily accessible. And they, they range uh, dramatically in capabilities. But the reason why they're really important is because of the access that they provide uh, to the web server, whether it be running commands specifically, uploading, downloading files, that kind of thing. Uh, and like I said, they're, they're very easy to obtain. So in a lot of cases, actors don't have to build their own. So the, the one web shell that we're going to be talking about today is not one of those, those web shells that you can freely grab off the internet. Uh, this is a custom built um, web shell that an adversary was using. They developed it to be used in their, their, um, their campaigns in the Middle East. And my, me and my colleague uh, named it Two-Face because of the unique design in which they, they used to develop it. And as Rob was mentioning, this is the one uh, that I showed at this very conference last year, or at the time. Uh, I, didn't, I couldn't find a name for it. I could have sworn, you know, I, I can't possibly be the first one to come across this. Still probably wasn't. We just happened to be doing the same research from a couple different angles at the same time. And we're able to come together to kind of update this and give you guys some new information. Yep. So I named it. It's, it's, a, it's a silly name, but it's, it's, it was named because there's two layers to it. Okay? The first layer is a loader. It does its, whole, its own big responsibility is to install the second layer, which is the two-phase payload. Uh, that, and, that's, and we're going to talk about this in detail going through this talk. So what's the loader? Like I said, it's, it's purpose is to install the second layer, which is the payload. But what, what they did was the actors actually took their loader code and appended it to legitimate content at that, um, on that, that web server. In this case, I chose one that was a news article on an IIS server. But what, what Josh and I are going to talk about you know, throughout this, com this uh, presentation, they also used it, uh, they appended it to error messages on Exchange servers. So they're really focused on Exchange servers. OK, so the loader, the, the, the actor, when they want to start interacting with the web shell, they, they send a specific get re uh, post request to the loader, which installs the payload, that second layer I just mentioned. As you can see on this slide, the, this is where all the capability uh, exists for this payload, uh, for this web shell. It's you know, pretty capable, uh, upload, download files, execute commands, uh, timestamp files. Uh, you can even run SQL queries on remote SQL servers. Um, but one thing I should focus on here is that you have to authenticate to this web shell to actually be able to use this thing. So you can't just you know, find this, this, uh, this web shell and start interacting with it without that password, which is really important. So how does the actor actually interact with this web shell? How, does, how do they construct the the, the, get, uh, the post request to the loader to install the payload. Well, the actor will provide a 64-byte key, which is you know, fairly massive. right? The loader will actually manipulate that key with a key salt, so that's, that's pretty clever. And then the result of that is going to be used to decrypt the embedded payload web shell, and then that's saved to the, um, to the, to the web server. And so that's the whole process, and I felt like that you really need to see it to, to, to believe like what, what that process is. So I made a, a demo video. Okay? Like I said, that we're going to talk about Exchange primarily, but they also had one sample that I'm going to show you right now that ran specifically on IAS. So for simplicity, I just chose that sample, and I set up an IAS server just to show you how it works. Yeah, it's important to note that IAS is a dependency of Exchange, so there's not too much of a difference here. Yep. So here I'm just showing you in this video, I just set up a simple web server. And I'm showing you that this web server, the only thing that's hosted on it is the two-face loader that I named two-face.aspx right there. 
Okay? We're going to hop over into the browser and just, and just browse to it. Okay? And what you're going to see is something very similar to what you saw on the slides there. You're going to see some new, a news article that was meant to be on that web server. There it is. But if the actor wanted to actually use the web shell, they're going to have to interact or instruct the loader to install the payload. So I wrote a script to be able to you know, do that myself. So here's the, the, the key that's required to, to install this particular payload. So I'm going to run my script, which is going to craft the correct HTTP request, which is going to, up, it's going to send the, the, uh, the key over with the file name to drop it to. There it goes. The two-face uh, loader responded back saying, yep, yeah, I installed the payload. And we're going to hop back over to the IIS server. I'm going to show you that the this, this new file called drop.aspx is going to be on the IIS server as well. There it is right there. So if we navigate to that in the browser, that's where you're going to see the functional web shell for two-face right here. It's a little bit different than the one you saw on the slides, but very similar variation. So right now I'm trying to just run a command, who am I on, in this web shell? And it didn't work, because I had to authenticate. And you can see that that bar at the top is red. And when I authenticated, it turned green. And now I run the who am I command, and it worked perfect. Okay? Um, so that, so we're going we're gonna to talk about Two-Face in, in, in depth coming up, and exactly what the actor was running command-wise. Uh, so just when, when you see us talking about running commands and doing things using Two-Face, think of the actor actually interacting with something like this. Okay? So, uh, from a hunting perspective, how did we go about uh, hunting Two-Face in the web shells themselves? As a threat researcher, I rely a lot on, on Yara rules and other kind of detection signatures, so we had to write them, right? But the whole purpose of the, the two layers for Two-Face was that the loader layer is very obfuscated. It's difficult to detect. So, what did we have to do? We had to figure out how to detect the payload that's embedded within the, the loader. So, how did we do that? Well, we took a look at the actual decryption mechanism within the loader, and we found this is how they applied the key salt to the 64-byte to the key, and then they used that, that resulting uh, value as the, the, um, the, the key to decrypt the embedded payload. And I don't know if there's anyone in here that studies ciphers, but this is probably the weakest cipher in the history of, of, of um, cryptography. They're using addition and subtraction, so we can easily just reverse that. And we wrote a simple script to do a crypto attack on it. And we were able to find the 64-byte key. And then we were able to write some Yara rules for the, the payload, because we now have the clear text. Okay? So from a threat researcher, that's how I went about uh, digging through our content by writing Yara signatures or Yara rules to hunt for these, for these payloads. All right, now that we have seen a little bit about what web shells are, how they work, and uh, how this attacker was using it, uh, it's time to go hunting. And if you've maybe been living under a rock for the past few years or haven't gone to a few other conferences, you may have missed the fact that attackers think in graphs. When I go hunting, I want to think like a bad guy, so I need to think in graphs to be successful in my hunt. So let's look at how we can, or how an attacker might get the web shell onto the target, onto the exchange server. So here I've created a couple of different attack graph scenarios. The first one I call here is the attacker's hope. This is how the attacker wishes it worked. Uh, it's, not, it's plausible, but not likely. It may also be how your management might think this type of attack works. So here our attacker, or our admin, uses domain admin everywhere. He's never heard of credential hygiene. He just logs in with his domain admin cred, so everybody gets it. In fact, if you all look under your seats right now, You've all got domain admins. So now our attacker is going to attempt to directly compromise the Exchange server. He's going to try a few different techniques. This is standard for implanting any kind of web shell on any server. However, these techniques tend not to work on Exchange servers. There's no SQL in Exchange, so SQL injection is not going to work. There might be a remote file inclusion that's probably not going to work. You might have uh, some cross-site scripting. Again, plausible, probably not going to do anything. I might have local file inclusion. They're going to try it. Probably not going to work in this instance. Our most likely culprit is going to be remote code execution. Uh, I could not find any remote code execution vulnerabilities in Exchange itself. There have been some in the underlying IIS in the past. Uh, but 
if you have a fairly up-to-date system, unlikely here as well. Uh, but here they're going to use the remote code execution, get access to the Exchange server, and because our domain admin uses creds everywhere, he's going to go ahead and run Mimikatz, not a virus, and dump creds, and then use that to gain access to the rest of the environment. Now let's look at a more likely scenario. Here our attacker starts by sending an email to their target. Our user here loves email, loves attachments, uh, needs to enable macros, and because they just love to run macros, they go ahead and run it. Now our attacker has gained a foothold into the environment, but they need elevated permissions. This scenario, we're a little bit better at our credential hygienes. We haven't exposed our domain ad creds to this uh, endpoint, so it's going to cause a little havoc, induce a help desk call. Our help desk just wanting to do good here logs in with their admin credentials onto this box, allowing our attacker to gain access to a file server that the help desk just happened to be an admin of as well. However, he was not an Exchange admin, so we're kind of going in a roundabout path here to make our way to the Exchange server. Here our attacker finds a misconfiguration in an Exchange. He didn't have to exploit any vulnerabilities here. He's able to directly access the file system and drop the web shell payload onto the Exchange server. So from there, because Exchange is 99% of a domain admin, he doesn't even need to bother trying to go after that. Remember, domain admin is never the goal of the attacker. He's after the data. Exchange is a high value target. It stores a lot of information in it. And from there, he can modify other groups and uh, objects in AD to give himself access to these other sources of data that they're truly after. So sometime later, our security team gets a virus alert because one of the tools uh, got uploaded to virus total and we finally got some signatures on it. So our security team comes in and uh, he just cleans up everything that he got a virus alert on because they're not really doing any true threat hunting here. They're just doing that reactive stuff where they're just responding to alerts. Now you'll notice that there's one thing on this slide that our security guy didn't find and it's that web shell hiding on the exchange server. Brings us to our last scenario here, which I call return of the attacker. Because we missed the web shell on the exchange server, our attacker can immediately come back in. And now he's a little mad that, uh, and wants better access than he had before. So he goes after the domain admin creds this time and regains uh, complete control of the environment. So Josh gave some really good scenarios there with the, um, with the attack graphs. Uh, I'm going to actually talk about a little bit of the commands that we, we saw during, during my team's research efforts on this uh, in regards to what the adversary did with their access to that, to that network. So um, I really, really wanted to make a pew pew map. So um, this is, we're going to start talking about geographically where the actors were uh, carrying out these activities from. And it just gives a little bit of a high level uh, 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 insight into where, what they were doing. So uh, dating, uh, going back to June 16, 2016, I, I know this is, I know this is a uh, you know timely and pertinent information. But um, back on June 16th, we saw the first activity from this specific adversary on this network. And what they did was, you can see that little orange uh, server down in the the bottom right corner here. Uh, that is our exchange server. Okay. And what the adversary did on June 16th was they actually used legitimate credentials to log into to Outlook, specifically OWA. And they actually used an IP address uh, from um, Iran, if, from all places. So this kind of lines up with the scenarios that we're just going to. Obviously, they had already obtained credentials into the environment. They weren't exploiting something on the Exchange server first. They're using what they got to get in. Uh, the next day, they, lo they also logged into the Exchange server from the same IP address. And then the next day, on June 18th, that's when we start seeing this adversary using uh, the two-faced web shell to, to interact with the, the, uh, the Exchange server specifically. Uh, fast forward a couple months later in September, we saw this, this adversary log in, or uh, I'm sorry, use two-face uh, to run six commands from an IP address in France. 
And then again in, from France, running 16 commands in March. And then I really wish we had pew pew noises. Pew pew. Um, 61 commands they ran in April. And then uh, finally in May 2017, we saw the last activity, which was uh, 10 commands run from an IP address in Germany. So you can see that this threat group uh, has, has the, the, at least the foresight to know that uh, some sort of forensic analyst is going to see where all these, these activities are coming from uh, and to try to you know, cloak where they're, they're originating from. So let's kind of dig into each one of those, those dotted lines there, what they did with their access, okay? So like I said, on June 16th, they used, they used legitimate credentials to log into OWA. So what did they do? So they immediately opened up the address book and they, they, went, they looked through 15 different distribution lists and over the course of you know, a couple hours, they looked through 81 different user accounts, okay? So that's pretty interesting. Why did they do that? Well, what they did was they used one of those distribution lists that at this organization was called Network Support, and they sent an email to them. Uh, the subject was uh, Network Team Support. Now, we don't know what the attachment was, and we don't know what the content of the message was, but if you think about that distribution list and the people that are probably on that distribution list, they probably have some pretty decent access to the rest of the network. Yeah, what, what better way than to fish your target by making the email come from within inside the domain? Yep, pretty clever. Um, so unfortunately, we don't know how they did it, but that is likely what they did right here. So I said again, they, they logged into the Exchange server the next day. But this time, they didn't, they didn't do anything with, with emails or anything like that. They actually went and downloaded a, what they call the offline address book from Outlook. So they used Outlook to just download this file for, um, that contains the address book, probably for some offline par, uh, uh, just processing or, or data retention. So they don't have to keep interacting with the Exchange server to, to look through these. Uh, a lot the of valuable information they can get out of here. So it's going to have not only the email addresses of everybody in the organization. It's also going to have any external contacts they had stored in there. But phone numbers, addresses, office locations, uh, and possibly some of their organization structure. They can see who's a manager of who, depending on what attributes they've populated on these accounts. Yeah, and imagine doing data exfiltration as an actor using something like Outlook. That's, that's pretty awesome. So the next day is when we saw the first activity using this web shell, OK? So remember I said that there was a loader and a, a payload uh, layer to Two-Face. In the top left corner of the slide, you can see this URL, um, error2.aspx is the file that they're interacting with. And that's, that's a legitimate page in Exchange. That's the actual error page that Exchange 2010 uses. So they're appending the code to a legitimate file on the server to act as their loader. Yep. And then what they're doing with that loader is they're using it to install the payload at error3.aspx. And they, I mean, if there's an error2 a ASPX that's legitimate, there's probably an error3 uh, uh, ASPX that a legitimate file as well. Right, if you're not paying close Where's attention, it? this is something that you might miss, especially if you're not familiar with the application itself yeah. and what's supposed to be there. Error 3 doesn't exist, does it? It does not exist. Okay, good. So um, with this access, they run one command and one command alone, and it's this, this who, who am I command. So we actually think that they just did this to see what, they, what, what account they had access to, uh, or if the, the, um, the, the two-phase payload. Fun fact, that account would be system. Yes, it is. Because this runs in the system, system context. <laughs> so now uh, they know that their, their, uh, their web shell is successfully deployed, and uh, they don't do anything else. They just kind of, they don't do anything. So fast forward about two months, two and a half months, we start seeing this adversary use the, the web shell to do some more interesting stuff. Okay? So the first thing that they do is they upload this executable m64.exe to the, using the web shell and then they run it with very specific parameters. Now, if you look at those parameters, you can probably tell what this is. This is, this is Mimikatz, okay? Yep. This and is if, if you've never seen somebody run Mimikatz on an Exchange server specifically, front end running OWA, it's pretty much like cracking open a credential pinata. There's credentials spilling out all over the place. Yep. So, and what they did was they outputted this information into a text file, 01.txt, and then they exfiltrate that data using the web shell by using the type field, uh, type command. And in Windows, that just displays the contents of a file, 
they copy and paste it from their web shell to their own system, and they've exfiltrated the, uh, the, the credentials. So it's pretty, pretty clever. Then they clean up after themselves by just deleting the text file, the executable, and the two-face payload from the server to clean up their tracks. Okay, uh, jump six months into the uh, future to March uh, 3rd, 2017. This is where we start seeing them doing some pivoting activity using the web shell. So the first thing that they do is they run this net group command looking for exchange trusted subsystem. And that's a really powerful group. That is what makes an exchange server pretty much 99% of a domain admin. That group has rights to do almost anything in Active Directory. It typically is only going to have uh, the exchange server computer objects as a member. If you see anything else besides an exchange server computer object in that group, uh, that means something's wrong. Sometimes uh, organizations will put people in there by mistake, um, but definitely worth investigating. Yep. So, so what that, that command does is it gives you a list of all of the host names for exchange servers on the network. Okay? And so what the actor did after that was they just started trying to, to find where Outlook's uh, content is being hosted for OWA and those kind of services uh, on these remote exchange servers. And I can kind of tell that they knew exactly what they were looking for here because they're enumerating a very specific path. This indicates that their target was Exchange 2010. Yep. And so what they did was when they found that path, they uploaded another web shell to the current web shell called exchange.aspx. Then what they did was they just time stomped it to match the same timestamps as a legitimate file in, in Exchange. And this yeah. one specifically was exchange.asmx. Yeah, asmx is a legit file that's for the Exchange web services, kind of like an API interface uh, for Exchange. And it, pretty clever, you know, it's one letter off in the extension. So again, something you might miss, especially if you're just looking through uh, some log files. Yep. So one, after they time stomped it, what they did was that's when they started doing their lateral movement. They used the copy command. That's all they did. They just copied that new web shell over to the other, uh, the other exchange servers that were, uh, which were discovered using that net group exchange trusted subsystem. Yep, and that exchange trusted subsystem has to be a local administrator on every exchange server in order for exchange to function. So that's how they're very easily able to laterally move between all the exchange servers in the environment. Yep. Finally, before they, they end the, their activity here on, in March, they just delete the payload, the two-phase payload, and they move on. They come back a couple months later in April, and what we think happened was they lost access to one of their, their exchange server, or one of the web shells that's hosted on the exchange server. And what they did was they, they came back, they ran that same ex, uh, net group exchange trusted subsystem command to find all of the exchange servers on the, on the network, and then they, they run the host name command to figure out where they're at, or which one of those exchange servers that they're currently interacting with. Yeah, this could have been because of like we showed in the scenario earlier that maybe our security personnel at the target organization found something and cleaned up uh, the original web shell. But more than likely, it could have been just uh, they had to replace the server because they had a hardware malfunction or something else that caused them to replace the exchange server. Yep. So after that, what they start doing is they start trying to, to, to list the contents of the, the, that specific path within Exchange on the other, the other four Exchange servers on the network. And it's telling that they probably lost access to one of those in these, uh, with these commands. They immediately try to ping ser uh, server number three, and um, we don't see the output of this, obviously, but it's highly likely that that, that didn't succeed. Because then the next thing they do is they try to list the contents or try to access the C drive and the D drive on that server, and they weren't, they weren't successful, okay? So what did the, the actor do to, 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 you know, in response to this? They uploaded yet another web shell to this web shell, and this global.aspx that they uploaded was just another variant of Two-Face, and they used the attrib uh, um, command to hide it, and then they copied it over to all of the Exchange servers they still had access to. That global ASPX is not unique to Exchange. It's actually uh, part of IIS. It's typically a hidden file uh, that holds configuration information. It's not always present, and it's typically not accessible. It's not served by the web server, so you can't access it through a browser, generally only through a file system. So while they were on the web server, they uploaded another, another executable, mom.64, which, again, is Mimikatz. They exfiltrated the output by using the type command. 
and then deleted a bunch of files to clean up after themselves, including the text file, including the executable, and the, the two-face payload web shell itself. Okay, so this is the last activity that we saw was in May 2017, and we believe this is the, we, we lost uh, visibility onto this because uh, the organization that was impacted started doing remediation and they actually you know, caught these guys and, and was able to successfully kick them off their network. But what we saw them do before, before that happened was they immediately tried to ping an external uh, IP address, 4.2.2.4, and we think that they were doing that to, to see if they could establish uh, outbound network connections. And immediately after that, they tried to find domain admins on the network by running this netgroup command. Uh, and yet again, they upload another executable and this one's Microsoft Update.exe. Yeah, obviously these are good guys now, right? They're trying to patch the server for them because they feel bad for their, their target. I think. Yeah, and they're also dumping the credentials while they're doing that. And uh, one other thing that I should mention, though, and, and it, it may have been um, kind of glossed over, is the names of the Mimikatz tools that they're uploading kind of blend into other Microsoft executables as well. So they're trying to their, their best to, to, to hide uh, while they're doing all this. So they run that that executable, and you can see that the, the parameters change a little bit, but again, this is Mimikatz. They're outputting the, the credentials to mic.txt and then ex exfiltrating it with the type command. So you can start seeing that there's a, a clear trend happening here. Every time they access the, the web shell, they're dumping credentials to see if they got anything new and to expand their, their, their presence on the network. So now that we've had our bad guy hat on, let's put our good guy hat on and take a look at how we would examine this type of stuff on the Exchange server itself. Uh, the first thing I need to do is find out where the logs are at. Um, if I'm coming in and I'm not familiar with the Exchange environment where I'm doing my hunt, I can whip up the uh, Exchange management shell here, which is the PowerShell module, and run the command here in the first example. That's going to tell me where all of the Exchange servers are, specifically the ones that have the client access role on it, which is going to be what runs OWA, so I know how to focus my hunt. The second command here is going to show me the, where the IAS logs are stored. Now, they're generally going to be in the default location, but this will tell you where they're at in, if they've been moved. Uh, just quick to run and find out. So once I've gathered my logs, I need to look for some indicators within those logs. And our first big giveaway that there's something fishy going on here is post operations that have a low request count. Uh, there are very few pages on an Exchange server that are going to have post period. And those are going to have a very high count uh, because you're going to have normal day-to-day -day users accessing it on a regular basis, issuing that post to it. And if, and if you think about from, from my pew, pew map, there weren't a lot of commands that were being run each time they visited the web shell. So it's, it's likely those would kind of be exposed. I mean, 61 commands is going to be 61 post requests, right? Yep. And that's probably going to stand out when you're looking at other, uh, other legitimate files that are handling post requests yeah. in Exchange. They're going to have lots and lots and lots and thousands of, of requests. Now, you might run into a few uh, kind of false positives here and there because it, it's case sensitive when it logs. So if you have somebody that types the URL in in a weird way, they might uh, trigger a, a post count for that. Um, but those will be very easy to filter out uh, when you're looking at this here. So the next thing that we want to look at will help us focus our hunt is to pay close attention to URIs that don't require authentication. If I'm an attacker putting a web shell on any kind of uh, web server here, I don't want to be blocked by having to authenticate before I can load the page. I want to be able to access it uh, with anonymous so that it comes right up every time. And then finally, you want to look at uh, get requests that fail, uh, 404 errors. Now, there's bound to be uh, a few here and there, typically very low on static applications like Exchange, uh, but the reason I have this up here is last year I was uh, investigating a, another uh, web shell and the attackers had actually modified the logging configuration on the Exchange server so that it filtered access to the web shell out of the logs. Now they hit it in that same error2.aspx, which I would expect somebody would run into an error eventually Right? You'd have a legitimate entry in the log for the error page, 
So what stood out is there were no entries for the error, error page at all. So I flipped over and looked at the 404 errors, and now, because attackers are humans just like us and make mistakes, I saw the attacker making typos trying to access their web shell. That gave them away. So once I've gathered this information, the next thing I want to look at is the user agent string. Now, even in very large environments where you have hundreds of thousands of users accessing this all day and night, the attacker's user agent string tends to stand out. This is because they often use it uh, similar to the 64-byte key that Robert was talking about. It's an access method to the web shell. If I connect and I, my user agent string doesn't match the one that I programmed into the shell, I don't see the shell. This prevents hunters, legitimate users, from accidentally stumbling upon the web shell. Yeah, and I can, I can speak to the user agent specifically to this threat group. They love really old versions of Firefox, like many, many years old versions of Firefox. So they kind of stand out when you're doing, doing this kind of um, hunting. And remember, user agent strings are very easily faked. So pay close attention to those. Once you've gathered your user agent string, you can use that to start tracking some of the attacker's activity. So here I'm showing, we have the user agent string that connected to the web shell, and then immediately after, we see the user agent string accessing OWA itself and the user account that they use to log into OWA. So now I know my attacker is using the credentials that they stole to access this mailbox specifically. Now, there may be a chance that you could mix up some legitimate use, but to make yourself extra certain that you are tracking the attacker activity, you can add in looking at the client ID field. Uh, this is in Exchange 2013 and later. In earlier versions, it was session ID. This ID is a unique GUID that is a server-side representation of the cookie that the client generates. So it's persistent and unique to the session that initiated it. So using that, we'll go in and dig through and find out, OK, what accounts did my uh, attacker access? I know that I need to put those on my remediation list and do something about it. it might also help us track you know, what type of information uh, that they may have taken out of these mailboxes. One other method, I actually introduced this last year. It's a PowerShell script uh, that's basically a wrapper around Jared Atkinson's Power Forensics comparing uh, the file time in the master file table. So what this does is it uses the install time on the Active Directory attribute of the Exchange server as the baseline. This is the time that all the files in the install should match. If they don't match, throw me an alert, as you see here, saying that, hey, this file looks like it doesn't belong. It works in 2013 and later only because every update is a full install, so every file will have the same file time except for anything that doesn't belong. And with that, I have one last graph for you. So we use everything that we learned here today. Our, here our environment is already completely compromised. Our security guy asked for our D for help. Our D for expert comes in and they start their investigation with the Exchange server. Sometimes you go in for a hunt and it might be proactive. Uh, you don't know where to start. Exchange is a high value target. It's a really easy place to start. It's a really easy place to knock off your list. As you can see, you can just filter through some logs, run the script, easily find what you're looking for. So now our d hero comes in, finds those unusual post operations we were talking about, knows that this looks like a web shell. They go ahead and clean the web shell up and start tracing the activity of the attacker through the environment, uh, cleaning up things and getting the attacker out as we go along. So with that, thank you all. Okay, we are good. All right, thanks everyone.